Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here representing the health department as the newly appointed health commissioner. I want to. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is a very important and meaningful event. Um, and I want to thank all of the s uh, sponsors that are present. NAMI Baltimore Executive Director, Carrie Graves. Jewish Community Services Executive Director, Joan Grayson Cohen. MedStar Health, uh, represented by Dr. Stuart Levine, President and Chief Medical Officer of Harbor Hospital and Vice President of MedStar Health. Dr. Stuart Bell, Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer, Good Samaritan Hospital and Union Memorial Hospital. Catholic Charities Executive Director, Bill McCarthy, Behavioral Health Systems Baltimore CEO, Krista Taylor. Baltimore Jewish Council Executive Director, Howard Libet. Maryland Faith Network, Baltimore Magazine President Michael Teitelbaum and the, Jewish, and the Associated Jewish Community Federation of Baltimore, President Mark Terrell. I'd also like to recognize the elected officials and their representatives. Nathan Wilner on behalf of uh, John Cardin, Delegate Dahlia Attar, and Michelle Bernstein from the Baltimore County Executive's Office. Thank you all again for coming and thanks for your support. Please take a few minutes to visit the tables in the lobby, either during intermission or after the program for information about mental health services and resources provided by our sponsors. I would guess that everyone here has somehow been affected by mental illness, whether you're personally affected or you have a family member or loved one who is affected. In my case, it's my first cousin. We were born about two months apart, and growing up, we lived about 15 minutes away from each other. Uh, in middle school, we were inseparable. Um, however, in high school, he began having behavioral problems and was ultimately sent to a military school. By our freshman year in college, my first cousin was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In retrospect, I feel like there were so many signs that our family missed. Uh, the chronic marijuana use that led to episodes of paranoia, maybe his attempt to quiet the voices um, or make them louder, the behavioral challenges that ultimately got him expelled from high school, and a possible learning disability that was never diagnosed. Uh, despite being a physician and the city's health commissioner, telling this story was hard for me, which just highlights that stigma persists even within the medical community around mental illness. So I applaud those with the courage to come up and share their stories. Um, sharing stories about behavioral health is what helps us fight stigma and encourage hope. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica Hinklin, Hinken and Laura Wexler co-founders and co-producers of the Stoop Storytelling series. Stoop Storytelling is a Baltimore-based live show and podcast that features ordinary people sharing the extraordinary true tales of their lives. The mission of the Stoop is to build community through the sharing of personal stories. Since its founding in 2006, the Stoop has featured the tales of more than 2,500 people on stage, including notable citizens such as Congressman Elijah Cummings, the Wire creator David Simon, activist D. Ray McKesson, and Senator Barbara Mikulski. The Stoop has been featured in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Without further ado, please welcome Jessica Hinken and Laura Wexler. Good evening, everyone. I am Laura Wexler, one of the founders and producers of The Stoop, and I want to thank you all for coming out to the show this evening. We are delighted and honored to be part of this event and to um, have the opportunity, the privilege, really, to share these stories with you. Um, if you have been to The Stoop before, then you know that we operate on a very simple um, structure, which is that we pick a theme and we um, ask seven everyday people, so they're not professional writers or actors or professional storytellers, just people like you and me, 
um, to share stories on that theme. And each storyteller is gonna share a true personal tale about seven minutes. If you hear a little bell, it's just us gently reminding them of the time limit. Um, and other than that, that's really all you need to know. Just sit back and, um, and really you're in for, um, you're in for a real special evening. I wanna introduce Jessica Henkin, my partner, who's gonna introduce the first storyteller. Hi everyone, thank you so much for making your way out on a Tuesday evening. Um, the pollen is uh, high, as we know, but um, there are tissues on stage for other reasons, which is that we are going to be sharing true personal stories and these stories can get um, heavy uh, and sad and um, they also can be light and funny, but um, all of that is okay here. So we want you to really embrace that this is a safe space tonight. You're gonna hear stuff that might be hard, but it's universal. So with that said, I want to introduce our brave first storyteller, because that person has the hardest job in some ways, but then the easiest, because they get it over with and they can focus on the rest of the show. They remember more than anyone else that night, because they're just sitting and taking it in after they've finished. So uh, the hero in that regard is Andy Parsley, who has enjoyed working in special education and disability services for over 30 years. He loves living in Baltimore and taking trips with his wife and their two college-aged daughters. Earthling, the family cat, can be a real pain in the neck, so he never gets invited to come along. Please welcome Andy. It was the early 1990s. I had a job with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, living and working in group homes for adults with developmental disabilities. I was also starting a master's program in special education at Johns Hopkins. At the house where we lived, I had some things stored in the corner of the garage. Now these things weren't valuable, and I didn't really need them, but one day it felt very important that I check on these things to make sure they were okay. So I did and everything was fine. But the next day, the feeling returned even stronger. And I felt like I had to check on everything again. And this kept happening. And then other things started to seem unusually important too. Everything had to be symmetrical and level. Doors had to be all the way opened or all the way closed. With my schoolwork, I felt a need for perfection that was often so intense that it was nearly impossible to get anything done. And this list of new problems kept growing. And it was very time consuming. And it was also scary because I didn't know what was wrong with me and because I didn't know if this was gonna keep getting worse. And then one day there was a shift and it got much, much worse. I couldn't free myself from the feeling that I could inadvertently do or think something that would send myself or my loved ones to hell when we died. Now this was especially weird because I don't believe in hell. I'm a Christian, but I'm the type of Christian who believes in the validity of other faiths and I believe that God is a loving God who wants us to take care of each other. But this feeling was as real as a gun to my head and it was constant. I could only shut it off if I was completely focused on something else, and often not even then. It filled all the empty spaces. On top of this, I developed a whole new set of behaviors, which I hid from others as best I could. Because of the significance of the number 666, if I saw license plates with any pattern of sixes on them, I felt like I had to keep looking at other license plates until I had seen enough of them without a pattern of sixes, even if it meant driving past my home at night and circling the neighborhood. If I looked out a window and I saw birds flying in a downward direction, which you could say is in the direction of hell, 
I had to keep looking out the same window until I saw birds flying up. My girlfriend bought us tickets to see my favorite, my favorite band, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And in the weeks leading up to the concert, I listened to one of their songs that I had never heard before, in which they mock fire and brimstone Christians. After I heard those lyrics, it just felt too dangerous to attend, and I insisted that we skip the concert. I also insisted that nobody else could use the tickets either. While these behaviors, and there was many more than I just shared with you, these behaviors were really challenging. The most difficult thing by far was the constant fear which was ever present in my life. The library on the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus is a little different in that it starts at ground level and goes down four floors into the earth. I was on the third floor down when I stumbled upon a book called Obsessive Compulsive Disorder in Children and Adolescents. I cracked this book open and I ended up reading it more intensely than I've read anything before or since. What I remember most is the first-hand accounts from people who were suffering from the various forms of OCD. They described the ritualistic behaviors and the intrusive thoughts that were part of their lives. And I felt like I was reading a book about myself. I finally knew what was wrong with me. Flash forward four years and I had been to see three different therapists and none of them had been able to help me. I don't think they knew much about OCD and I don't think they had much faith that I could get better. The optimism that I had gained from my discovery in the Hopkins Library was long gone. On my way to meet therapist number four, I was waiting at the elevator and I was joined by a guy a little bit older than myself. The elevator was taking a really long time and this guy sighed a little bit and then he opened up to the, the door to the stairwell and he ran up. The elevator finally came and a few minutes later I walked into the therapist's office and I could see that my therapist was the same guy. Now maybe he just hated being late, but it seemed like he had just run up six flights of stairs to get that first moment right. Over the next several months, he put the same energy into every moment of every session. I would explain the repetitive mess going on inside my head, and somehow he would get inside there with me and help me find my way out. Over and over, he helped me to challenge the disorder that had defeated me every day for over six years, no matter how hard I tried. And together, we turned the tables on that SOB. Within six months, I was pretty much better, and within a year, I was completely free. And I've remained free from obsessive compulsive disorder for over 20 years. I need to thank my wife for sticking with me during that difficult time. Sorry about those tickets. And I need to thank Dr. Jeffrey Lading, who healed my mind. I'm grateful to him for every moment of quiet and calm that I've enjoyed in the past two decades. Thank you. So our next storyteller is Vijay Ramasamy, who actually works for the health department. Um, he's a proud Indian American government and public policy nerd from Overland Park, Kansas. He's a painfully amateur basketball star, an avid Calvin and Hobbes enthusiast, and an aspiring Leslie Nope. And if you don't know what that is, check out Parks and Rec. He is a 2018 graduate of Johns Hopkins University in public health studies, and he plans to devote his career to helping ensure health as a fundamental human right for all people.
For as long as I can remember, I have lived two different lives. My family came to this country in 2001 with three boys, a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, and the 4-year-old rambunctious one who stands before you today. They were immigrants to this country from India. They came here for opportunity. We moved to a small, quiet, Midwestern town. But for them, it was like an alien world. It was a clash of cultures, it was a clash of values, and it was rife with fear. I learned from a very young age from my brothers, actually, that our duty as children was to protect them from that fear, even if that meant hiding things that we were going through, or not telling them when we were upset, or not telling them about the crush we had in third grade. All of those things were meant as a source of love for them. My parents wanted us to be happy. They wanted us to have all the opportunities in the world. And for my mom, that meant that one of her children was to become a doctor. Her father, who I'm named after, was this incredible doctor in India, devoted to his community, was just a shining beacon of light for my mother. She lost him when she was my age, and ever since then, she wanted one of her children to become a doctor. I'm still very bitter. My two older brothers got out of it. They were like, we're good at math. We're going to go to engineering. So it came up on me. So from elementary to middle to high school, I tried to live two different lives. At home, I tried to live a life that I was quiet, I was religious, I was determined, I was focused on becoming a doctor. Outside of life, outside of life, outside of home, I was trying to explore the world, explore adolescence, explore what it meant to be American. I tr was quirky, I was loud, I wanted to act, I wanted to become the class clown. I actually did win class clown in fifth grade. Uh, but interestingly, I came home and hid that certificate in my room. I think it's still there. Uh, I won, actually I was runner up for, for best actor in eighth grade. I'm still bitter about that. Again, not a word to my parents. But things just get tougher as you go on and it was really hard to live two different lives. Times where I felt isolated, and it was hard to navigate what it meant to be Indian, and why didn't people like me, and what does this mean, and what does that mean, and how do I navigate the world, and I'm heartbroken, the only, like, the only 15-year-old uh, can be heartbroken. How do I navigate all of those things? But again, time and time again, I knew that I had to keep it inside because if I told my parents, they would worry. They would be fearful that they came to this country and their children weren't happy and they just made a mistake. Now when I got to college, and I got to Hopkins, and my parents were ecstatic. Their son was ready to become a doctor. I think it was that point when I started to realize some things. I started to get names for the things that I had been going through for a long time. I started getting names for being super nervous all the time or feeling empty and sad and afraid and alone. Those names were anxiety. They were episodes of depression. But those names weren't liberating. They brought more fear because they were just more things that I had to hide from my parents. When I was in college, I felt like the communication had broke down completely. Every single conversation was the same. It was, they would call me, I would, they would say, how are you doing? I'd be like, I'm fine. Like every middle schooler in the back of the car. They would say, did you eat? I'd say, yes. They'd say, how's school going? I'd say, I'm fine. Days where I'd be so anxious that I would literally rip apart all of my homework and pieces of paper. Again, they would call me, I'm fine, I ate, I'm okay. Days where I would just sit in the bed and kind of stare and feel empty and alone and trapped. Again, they would call, and I would say, I'm fine. I've eaten. I'm okay. This kept going for a long time. It kept going throughout college. I had wonderful friends, wonderful RA, and they helped me through it. But it was still like I was missing everything. I was missing that core part of me, and I just didn't know how to tell them. You can only live two lives for so long. And for me, the moment where things clashed together was when I had to take the MCAT, at the end of my college experience. It's not that big of a deal, but I think when I got home that summer, 
My parents had laid out all of the books they had bought me. They had all of my favorite foods prepared. They were just so, so excited for me to go to the next step. But I just felt empty and alone and scared. That summer was when everything broke down. I would get up in the morning, I would go to the library, they would think I was studying, and I would just sit there in the cubicle. I would stare at that book for hours and hours, just thinking to myself, why can't you just do this? Why can't you just make them happy? It just kept going day after day. I would come home, I'd go straight to my room, I wouldn't talk to them. It got to the point where one night, during this whole affair, I just came home, I went to my room, and I started crying. My dad, who my entire life had been this stoic figure, somebody who had braved many miles across the ocean, had done everything correct, had worked hard every single day for our family, had never gotten a failing grade, had always done the right thing, came to my room, and he said, I'm losing my son. He broke down, and he told me about the first time that he came to the United States and how because he didn't understand English and it was hard for him, he actually failed out. And he had to go back to India and start all over again. And after years of hard work, he finally got the opportunity to come back. Now, that story was the time when he was opening up to me. He was trying to say, I'm being vulnerable. But for me, I just sat there silent. It was the first time where my, my parents were, in fa- were had flaws, that they were real people. And another thing dawned on me that day. It was that it was never about the MCAT. It was never about this test. It was never about becoming a doctor, because that's like a Band-Aid. It's going to sting for a little bit for them, but they want me to be happy. The deeper thing was that I was scared to love myself. I was scared that if I told them that I was anxious, that if I was depressed, that they wouldn't love me and that I, wasn't deserve, I didn't deserve love. And a lot of that was because I didn't love myself. So I didn't say anything. I just sat there. Now things have gotten better in the medical school department. <laughs> um, I've talked to them. Things are working out. But again, Every time that I feel alone, I feel scared, I feel like I need my mom, I just say, I'm fine, I'm okay, I've eaten. And I think right now, as a 22-year-old, I'm trying to figure out this intensive process of how do I love myself enough to tell them that it's okay for me to say I'm flawed and I have all these mental health issues, but maybe showing them that class clown certificate is a first step. Thank you, Vijay. That was um, that was really touching. I uh, think we all want to give you a nice big mom hug right now. <laughs> Uh. So um, the next storyteller is um, some. Sorry, this is too low. This is our relationship in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so our next storyteller is. Um, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't mean to. I have to say that when she walked into the room, I'd only spoken with you by phone. Um, So I mean this, and I don't mean to belittle everything about you as a person, but you truly took my breath away because you're so beautiful, like, uh, on the outside. So let's put that aside. But just get ready, everyone, is what I want to say. So um, she's a cool mix of focused, fabulous, feisty, and 40, all wrapped up in a little nerdy package. And you're 40, and you still look like that. Good Lord. Okay. She holds many titles. Mom, sister, aunt, friend, teacher, mentor, mental health advocate, social entrepreneur, but prefers answering to diva, which stands for destined, intelligent, victorious, anointed. Servant leadership is the philosophy that helps govern her life. So please welcome Letitia Hicks.
1995, I lost my only brother to suicide. My only brother. I'm the oldest of three children, and he was the middle child. I didn't know how to handle that. In fact, when I lost my brother, my sister and I didn't get any help for that. No grief counseling, nothing. Why? Because no one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to talk about that he had a mental illness. No one wanted to talk about the things that were bothering him. No one wanted to even admit that he actually took his life. So in 1995, I did the best that I could and balled up all that grief, that pain, that hurt, the disappointment, and I stuffed it down inside. I didn't realize later I needed to address that because then I had to deal with my own mental illness that I didn't even know that existed for me because once again, that wasn't talk about. That's not something we discuss in our family. And most of people that look like me in our community, mental illness is not something we're gonna wanna talk about. So I dealt with that for many years. So fast forward to 2012, bottling up all that anger and frustration and grief and never getting help for the fact that my only brother took his life at the age of 14. So I'm dealing with this. Then finally, I'm, you know, at this time, I'm married with two kids and I'm still dealing with all these different health, mental health issues that I didn't even know that I had. I just knew that something was wrong, but I didn't have a name for it. So in 2012, I get hospitalized for the first time because I wanted to take my life because I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't understand why I was going through so many emotions. Why one day I'm so angry, I'm kicking a hole in the wall, and the next day I'm so excited, I'm ready to party, I'm ready to hit the club, I'm ready to look fly, okay? I couldn't understand why I'm going through this. So I ended up in a hospital. This time my ex-husband, my husband at the time, got tired of dealing with my foolishness. And he wanted it out. He wanted out. So once again, I ended up in this hospital. And while I'm in this hospital trying to figure out for the first time what's going on, why am I feeling this, why am I angry, one day happy, the next sad, the next want to cry, the next want to take my life, the next, what is going on? So finally, I get a diagnosis. I have bipolar type 2. And I'm excited. I'm excited because I finally got a name for this thing that's just driving me out of my mind. This thing that cannot allow me to be just consistent with my mood. I finally got a name. So I'm excited and I'm happy and I'm sitting here because it's two weeks in the hospital and I finally got a name and I'm reading up on bipolar type two and I'm minding my business and I'm, I'm getting better and I'm happy and as I'm sitting there reading about bipolar type two in this hospital that's supposed to be known for helping people with mental illness, a nurse comes, sits next to me and says, you don't have bipolar, you know, we don't do this. We don't get mental illness. We don't get depressed. You strong. You a strong black woman. We don't get sick. You gonna be okay, get it together. So what did I do? What did I do? You're right. I'm too strong for this. See, I survived sexual assault. I survived abuse. I survived rejection over and over again. And I survived rejection over and over again. And I survived rejection over again. I graduated with, with a 3.882. You telling me that I am bipolar? No, you're, you're right. I'm not. I'm not. So I did the next best thing. I did what I had to do to get out because I'm not depressed. This is not what I do. This is not what my ancestors represent. We nurse from our breasts the very men that will grow up to enslave our children. And you telling me I have bipolar? No, I'm too strong for this. I do not have bipolar. So I go through the motions and get out.
of the hospital. And then I get out the hospital and I'm fine. I don't go through the treatment because I'm not bipolar. I'm too strong for this. Do you see this? So I go through my first year after hospitalization feeling okay. Not realizing because I'm not keeping up with my treatment, I'm now going into hypomania. So in 2013, I am a married woman with two kids. I'm in grad school. I'm on the teacher, I'm sorry, the superintendent's teacher advisory council was chosen by the superintendent of this particular school system. And not only that, I, did I say I was in grad school? Yes, I'm in grad school and I'm managing two mentoring programs, one for girls, one for boys, and I'm active in my sorority. You can't tell me I'm not bad. You can't tell me I'm not bad. So no, I don't have bipolar, but I'm not realizing I'm going hypomanic. And so one day they asked me to take over this particular class because three children in, I'm sorry, three teachers in January decided, by January, three teachers decided they couldn't do it, do it anymore. So they asked me to take over this class. So I go in and I take over this class. And this particular day, I don't know if you ever work with seventh graders, which are 12 year olds. So anyway, this one young lady, you know, wanted to, you know, push my button that day. And I responded. Then she responded. Then I responded again. And then she keeps responding. And then eventually he goes. Then we go to lunch, we come back from lunch, and then she said something that triggered me. And before I knew it, we're going back and forth. We're going back and forth over and over and over again. And I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm fussing, I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I, who, honey, you know who you talking to you got the wrong one here and I'm going on and on and on and on and before I knew it it was 15 minutes and I didn't even know it was 15 minutes of me ranting and raving you know how I found out y'all I found out because a little gentleman on the side with a cell phone decided to record it and it went viral and I was on the evening news for two or three days and it devastated me. It devastated me, not because I was on the evening news and people saw this teacher going off on her students, but because the illness that I didn't want anyone to know I had was now exposed to the world. What they didn't see was the teacher that was holding food in her foul cabinets for children that were hungry. What they didn't see was the teacher that was in school seven Sunday through Sunday to make sure that her classroom was prepared for her kids. They didn't see that. They saw the illness and I got hate email. I got people asking if she has this issue why she's teaching. They didn't see all the sacrifice I put in. They saw the illness. And so what do you think? I go into the hospital again. This time, no one wants to be around me. And I find myself alone. And while I find myself alone, I'm getting more and more depressed. And so I go in and out the hospital because I still don't want to accept that I have this issue until around about my seventh stay, a gentleman came up to me and says, you know, no one can fight harder for your life than you. And when I heard that, I decided I can still be strong. I can still be brave. I can still be black. I can still be a woman. I can still be saved. I can still be all that I need to be because I am not bipolar, I have bipolar. See, you become who you say you are. I am strong. I am a black woman who knows her thing. I am educated. I love every child, every child every, from every nation. See, I am me. I manage what I have, which is bipolar. 
And because I learned to manage that, then I decided to get myself, after I got myself together, I decided to go back and tell other women, no matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what religion, no matter what ethnicity, you are strong, sister, regardless of what you have. And so then I decided to start my own nonprofit, Stand for the Diva Effect, because at the end of the day, whatever you see, you're going to see this diva. Thank you. So our next storyteller, Michael Teitelbaum, um, is the proud father of three young men. He's father-in-law to two young women, husband to one amazing wife, leader of 40 people at Baltimore Magazine, and a friend to as many people will have him. He served on the NAMI Metro Baltimore board for many years, four of those as board chair, and he now facilitates family support groups for NAMI. In his spare time, he's fighting the aging process with as many physical act activities as his body will allow, and he plays bass in a band that's aptly named The Wafflers. Please welcome Michael. Many moons ago, while backpacking through Europe, I met a young woman. We fell in love, and three years later, we were married at the ripe old age of 24. About three years after that, we had our first son. Two years almost to the day after that, son number two arrives. And three years after that, it was my three sons. At the same time, I was building a successful advertising business, and my wife was a well-respected teacher when she wasn't being a full-time mom. We were living a storybook life. Life was great. And that all changed about 12 years ago. And the fact of the matter is, it didn't all change, but it felt that way. Because that's when my youngest son started showing signs of serious emotional distress. We took him to a therapist, and after a couple of visits, she said it was beyond her. So she referred us to a psychiatrist. So off we go to the psychiatrist, and after the session, the psychiatrist comes back and meets with my wife and I and tells us that my son is struggling with mental illness. That was such a foreign concept to me. I swear I thought he said my son was mentally retarded. And I knew that couldn't be the case. It didn't make any sense because up until then, he was a straight-A student. He was a gifted athlete a talented self-taught musician, loads of friends. In fact, in many ways, he's the, he was the easiest of my three sons. Well, we knew we had to get to work and get him the help he needed, and we knew we needed to get educated, my wife and I. So we found him a good therapist, and the psychiatrist started prescribing meds, telling us that it was going to be trial and error, and he was correct. There were lots of errors. And my wife and I discovered NAMI, National Alliance on Mental, Ill Mental Illness. We first went to a family support group. And while the stories from the other participants were heartbreaking and gut-wrenching, in a certain sense, it gave me comfort in knowing that I wasn't alone and that we could tell our story and they would get it. We also discovered that NAMI had an educational course called Family to Family, and we did that, a 12-week course that covers everything about mental illness, all the various diagnoses, um, coping skills, um, the science, and quite honestly, the science went well over my head in many cases, but what I took away was that what my son was dealing with was scientifically based and not something he was just going to snap out of. The biggest lesson I learned with NAMI is a hard lesson, and that is that you have to separate the individual from the illness. And that's really hard because my son was all in one package. 
Lord knows there were many times where I felt like I hated my son. But I never lost an ounce of love for my son. I just hated that illness. My wife and I cried ourselves to sleep many a night. And by day, there was stress and tension and disagreement because we're two different people with two different perspectives and two different approaches about how to help our son. My wife was the detail person. She kept track of every detail. She got him signed up for every doctor's appointment and made sure he was there on time. She tracked all of the meds and made sure he had his meds. She kept a journal of every single medication and the combinations thereof and all of the side effects which came in really handy for the few times that we had to switch doctors and the few times that unfortunately he had to be hospitalized in the beginning. The value that I brought to the table, I like to think I brought a lot of value, but one thing that stands out, I was the designated conversationalist. Whereas my wife was very direct in her communication and my son wanted to be in control of everything, so that kind of communication didn't really sit well with him all the time. I could give him the space and time he needed. I, I did what I call planting seeds. Well, consider this and consider that and giving some reasons why he should consider that and then giving him the opportunity to think through it and hopefully come to his own conclusions. It didn't work all the time, but it worked better than that direct trying to control him. So the days and the weeks and the months and the years passed by. He did graduate high school. He tried college a few different times to no avail. He tried many a job and none lasted very long. He did volunteer at the Pearlstone as an organic farmer and that was a good thing. He actually got volunteer of the year one year. But overall, his mental health wasn't improving in the way that we wanted it to improve. His life wasn't moving forward, and he was stuck. And we all came to the conclusion, and when I say we all, I mean my wife, myself, my son, the psychiatrist, and the therapist, all agreed that he could be well served by going to a work-based healing community in Vermont called Spring Lake Ranch. And that's where he learned the value of routine, and structure, and work, and accomplishment, and socialization skills, and all the building blocks for good mental health. And then he transitioned to another work-based healing community in North Carolina called Cooper East. He was gone for a total of 27 months before returning home about three years ago, where he got himself set up in his own apartment. He started volunteering again at Pearlstone. He then started volunteering at Shepherd Pratt and he took a 500 plus hour program in becoming certified as a peer recovery specialist. And that's what he's doing today. He works at Mosaic Community Services as a certified peer recovery specialist, leading groups, working with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, taking his lived experience and helping them through their mental health challenges. I'm proud of all three of my sons, but my youngest son is my hero because of the overwhelming challenges that he has and continues to overcome every day. And I'll leave you with this. No matter how dark it appears to be, there is a light. Keep moving towards the light and never ever give up hope. Thank you. Thank you. So our next storyteller is Alexandra Wyckowski, and she's a full-time working wife and mother of two children under two years of age. So she's in desperate search of sleep. Um, she loves to hang out with family and friends, but she's also secretly happy when they cancel plans. She grew up in Connecticut and moved here to attend Hopkins for graduate school and stayed because she found a love for Baltimore and the love of her life. I'm a licensed mental health clinician. <clears throat> 
I make a career out of helping people find really good care. And I had no idea how hard that was until I had to do it for myself. In June of 2018, I gave birth to a beautiful little boy. <clears throat> Everybody fell in love with him as soon as he was arrived. When he was eight months, I found out, surprise, I was pregnant again. And nothing about that pregnancy was the same. I had respiratory issues, migraines, gestational diabetes. And when I was five months pregnant, my mom, who's my very best friend, had an issue with her heart and was medevaced to University of Maryland where she had open heart surgery. And as a result, became a paraplegic. I spent the rest of my pregnancy either at the hospital, wishing that I was home, or home, wishing that I was at the hospital, and I felt like I couldn't do anything right. I had a constant state of anxiety. I never felt calm. I felt like I was always moving from one thing to the next and I felt like I was making everybody miserable. When my daughter was born in November, she let out a big cry and she never stopped. She had colic, which only complicated the issue of having two children under two. Things at home got a little bit rough I was mad all the time. My poor husband, I took it out on him, and God love him, he did the best he could. But I knew, as a mental health clinician, that I needed to get help. For me, it was Christmas Eve. My husband and my son were upstairs sleeping, and I was holding my crying daughter, and I contemplated killing myself. I cried myself to sleep that night. And I woke up the next day and got my kids dressed in adorable little outfits. And we went and we celebrated Christmas like nothing happened. But I knew that I needed help. So at my postpartum appointment, when the nurse came in and asked me if there's anything I wanted to talk to the doctor about, I said I was suffering from the baby blues. My doctor came in. We did the exam. She asked me to meet her in the office. And she never mentioned it. And I thought to myself, if it's not a big deal to them, maybe I'm making a big deal out of this, and it's really, this is normal. So I didn't say anything. I had lost the nerve. I went home, and things continued to be pretty bad. Um, I looked at my children, and I was not enjoying being a mom. I wasn't enjoying being a wife. And I knew that I could have those feelings because I had had them with my son when he was born. So I decided that I was going to find a therapist. I have two kids under two. <laughs> Getting out of the house for an hour is kind of a big deal. So I found a therapist who was close by. She took my insurance, and she was open on Saturdays. And my husband lovingly took both kids, and I went out the door. And when I got there, my therapist wasn't there. The receptionist had given me the wrong day. <laughs> I had a nervous breakdown in that office. Um, the therapist very kindly agreed to meet me the next week. She's a great therapist, but she's not the therapist that I need. She, there were a lot of strange, awkward silences, and I really wanted someone to be a little bit more of a talker. But I continued to go, because finding a therapist that accepts your insurance and has a Saturday opening is really hard to find. I knew that I probably needed something more. And so I thought back to my college days when I had gone through a bit of a depression and was placed on Lexapro. And it did wonders for me. But I also knew that if I was to find a psychiatrist, it could take months to get an appointment. I could have to change my therapist. I'd have to take more time off of work. And that just wasn't going to happen. So I decided that I was going to find a new primary care physician. 
And I went in, and um, the nurse, God bless her, she sat at the computer and asked me what brought me in, and I said I was, again, having the baby blues. I don't think I wanted to name it as postpartum. It felt too severe for me. And uh, with her back to me, she grabbed a piece of paper and handed it to me to fill out. And she asked me a couple more questions. And then she said, in the past couple months, have you thought about killing yourself? And I said, yes. And she turned around and looked at me as though I hadn't understood her question. And the look of judgment on her face just kind of melted me. So she went out and got the doctor, and um, I waited probably for about five, ten minutes for the doctor to come in. And somehow I gathered enough energy that when the doctor came in, I spilled it all out. She said, what can I help you with? And I said, look, I have postpartum depression. I want you to put me on Lexapro. I know you're going to start me on at five milligrams, but we're going to end up at ten. She said, whoa, <laughs> okay, back up, tell me what's going on. And she sat and she listened. And um, I felt a real connection with her, like she understood, and she totally didn't minimize it, but made me feel comfortable in a way that no one else had and that I was craving for. She's done a great job about managing my medication, and there are days when I wake up and I feel like I am a phoenix coming out of the fire carrying water for those who need help. And there are other days that I still feel those embers burning inside myself. But I love being a mom now. My kids are so cute. And I love being a wife. But if there's one thing that I learned about this, it's that this, with this system, it doesn't matter how great the care is if we don't make it easily accessible for people. Fellow member of the 10 milligram Lexapro club right here. It's how I roll. All right, so our next um, storyteller is, um, <laughs> God damn it, <laughs> I just can't, I'm sorry, all right, I just can't, it's like a spatial awareness issue, okay, sorry, our next storyteller is um, actually someone that I um, was connected to through my husband, uh, Aaron Hankin from WYPR, um, and he is a huge fan of this gentleman. Uh, he finds him charming and intelligent and reflective, and um, he's just, he's true blue is how he says it. Uh, so Theo Hill is the gentleman I'm referring to. He has a podcast now on WYPR, called One Day at a Time in Recovery in Baltimore. When he's not doing the podcast, he is a truck driver and a substance abuse counselor. So please welcome Theo Hill. How did y'all like that introduction? Yeah. Look, let me clear the air, right? There's too much tension up in here. Look, don't these ladies look like they got it together? Huh? So look, when we first got in here, right, they made us uh, sit over there. And uh, they said we were going to go back to our seats. So what I did was I put all my stuff over there underneath the seat. Now, it just so happened that what I need is my keys. Can a lady please give me my keys that are underneath the seat? That was a clear to air. Now, what happened was, when she seen my keys, she asked me a question that a lot of people ask me. And uh, that question was, 
what do you do with all these keys, right? And I got a long version of the story. What we got, seven minutes? We don't have that kind of time for the long version. So I got to give you all the short version of the story. It might go right by you. Here it goes. It started with no keys. Is it coming to you? Did it go by you? Thank you for the introduction. My name is Theo Hill, and I'm straight from the hood. There's a crisis going down in Baltimore, three miles down the road, where there's gun violence and a whole bunch happening right here in our community. That's the elephant that's in the room tonight. Now, I might not have the answers on what to do, but I do know that we will start talking about it. And when I get on my podcast and I talk about in re one day at a time in recovery in Baltimore, I'm talking about what's going on in our community, the whole community. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born May 17th. 1954. Now, those who are historians, that's a very significant date in African-American history because it was the date that the Supreme Court, Brown versus the Board of Education in Kansas, declared segregation unconstitutional. And after that, the schools were segregated and people had to live together at that particular time. Now, most of us in here, I must say all of us, are not dumb to what's going on in our community. There's still a race problem. There's still a communication problem. However, we will start talking about that. And uh, the panel, they got a panel after this, y'all. They didn't invite me. I'm mad. But anyway, we're going to move on. On that significant date that I was born, um, my parents, well, my father was in the military. He was a military man, and uh, he was very strict. And when I was growing up, uh, I suppressed all my feelings when I was around him. But, man, you want to talk about a party animal? When I went out in the street, I was a free man. And what happened was I was attracted to a certain group of people. And these people happened to be alcoholics and drug addicts. And uh, I got involved. And I got involved for so long that it took a spiritual awakening for me to get in recovery. I didn't come to recovery uh, by asking God for, please help me. I came to recover because of pain. I was 45 years old, still in the street, still chasing drugs, still drinking alcohol, and I didn't have a place to stay. I was homeless. And then finally, I understand why God put me through that. He didn't put me through I put it through myself. But I understand the training by being in the military that I had to go through all that 32 years of active addiction in order to be on this stage tonight. So the day was November the 20th, 1999. And that's a significant date uh, uh, Prince said, we're going to party till it's 1999. <laughs> it just so happened to go along with my story. <laughs> okay, but anyway, this is what happened. Fast forward. and hey, They haven't hit the bell yet, have they? Hey, they might hit it on me, though, y'all. <laughs> so... I got clean. God got me clean. He lifted the veil off my eyes, right? He gave me an opportunity to see where I was living at. And I made a, a vow that I would never live like that again. 
that I was going to get clean and I was going to find out what my purpose in life was. But the first thing I had to do was uh, I had accumulated some charges in Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City. See, just because you get clean don't mean them charges going to come up off you. I'm letting y'all know that now. So the judge gave me, like, he gave me four years, which is is not, you don't, if you ever go to prison, don't tell nobody how much time you got. Because <laughs> they was mad at me. You got what? Anyway, I did, the, I, what I did was, when I was in there, I started a program, right, about recovery. One day at a time, in recovery, in prison. And, uh. I came home in 2003, and I continued on my path of recovery. I uh, went to school. I got a BA from Sojourner Douglas College. And two, thank you. Thank you. But I ain't stopped there. I said, the BA is fine, but you're going to carry this thing. So I went on to Coppin and got two more master's degree, right? And what I got him in was rehabilitation counseling, which is mental health, which justifies me being here. And the other one was substance abuse, right? And they call it co-occurrent now, where they both go hand in hand. And uh, so I got a job, but by nature, I'm a truck driver. And that's what I do. This is my uniform, got my name on and stuff. And I do that all day. Matter of fact, I got to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go up to New Jersey, to make a delivery, then come back, and then I go to the treatment facility where I work at in, uh, in Glen Burnie. And then uh, after that, Friday, I got the podcast to do. So my life now is, I wouldn't trade in for the world. It's real busy, and it's fruitful. But I just want to say to everybody in the audience, thanks for letting me share. Everyone's welcome to take their seats. How old? I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I'm not sure we can match the power of the storytellers, but we have some interesting questions and some wonderful panelists. So why don't you all come in and take a seat, and we will continue with this conversation. Thank you. Oh my goodness! Everyone got quiet real quickly. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sheila Cast. I host an interview show on WIPR Public Radio called On the Record. Thank you. How nice of you. And I also serve on the board of the Mental Health Association of Maryland. And um, I think this is a really important and necessary conversation that we're having tonight. And oh my gosh, were those stories not amazing. Oh my gosh. I got to tell you, I'm kind of glad that I'm not on this panel because they're going to have a hard time matching the level of insight. But I have great confidence that they will. Um, and so I'm glad you're all sticking with us to continue this conversation. Let me introduce our four panelists all at once because that way, whatever question gets asked, that somebody wants to, to answer, you'll already know who they are. Um, and so let me start with Kay Redfield Jameson. Um, and many of you already know Kay Redfield Jameson. She is a professor of psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, she, where she also serves as co-director of the Mood Disorders Center. She is the author of An Unquiet Mind, the best-selling memoir of her dual experience as a psychologist and a person with lived experience. In 2001, she was named a MacArthur Fellow. Dr. Kay Jamieson. <laughs> Sitting close to me, Renz Waneza. Renz Waneza practices at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital's neuropsychiatry program, where he has been recognized on multiple occasions as an over-the-top doc. He has, 
He has special interests and training in PTSD, dementia, and interventional psychiatry. He is board certified in both adult and geriatric psychiatry. He's a clinical faculty member at the Yale University School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry, where he completed both his residency and fellowship specialty training. Dr. Renz Wawensa. Wanessa. I'm getting there. Stacy Meadows, certified, uh, licensed certified social worker. Do I have that right? Stacy Meadows is manager of child therapy services at Jewish Community Services, where she oversees a team of clinicians who work with children, teens, adults, and families experiencing emotional and behavioral challenges. She earned her Bachelor of Art in psychology and religious studies from Elon University in North Carolina, studying neuro and social psychology at the University of Bristol in England. She earned a master's degree from the New York University Graduate School of Social Work. She holds advanced certification in child and adolescent trauma treatment from the University of Maryland School of Social Work and is certified in QPR suicide assessment and critical incident stress management with children. Recently, she was selected as a U.S. regional, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Nahum Goldman Fellow. And additionally, she's trained in a variety of holistic health models, which she incorporates into her work with clients of all ages. She's also a certified yoga and meditation instructor for both adults and children. Stacy Meadows. <laughs> and Bishop Kevin Daniels, born in Baltimore's inner city, is the senior pastor of St. Martin's Church of Christ, whose focus to the church and the community is moving from healing to wholeness. Bishop Daniel serves as chair of civic action with the Minister's Conference of Baltimore. He's also a tenured professor of social work at Morgan State University. Bishop Daniels. And I want to throw the first question to Bishop Daniels. Obviously, faith is a big part of why we're here tonight. The host of tonight's gathering reflects several strains, if you will, of faith. Catholic Charities and MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital, Jewish Community Services, Baltimore Jewish Council and the Associated, and the Maryland Faith Network, an interfaith approach to addressing health disparities. So the very fact that we are here together underscores that people of faith care about mental illness and want to help. But Bishop Daniels, and this is the question I address to you, should institutions of faith be doing more to change the conversation as it relates to mental illness and substance abuse? And if so, how can institutions of faith play a more active role in eradicating stigma? Could you, could you grab a mic? Of course, most of you know I know how to use a mic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope I didn't poke your nose. I wasn't trying to do that. No, no, no. You're okay. You That's great. And ah, there it is. There. Bishop, Bishop Daniels, everyone. <laughs> um, of course we can. One of the greatest challenges that we continue to have, I, as I was listening um, in the context of the stoop, um, listening to um, particularly uh, Leticia um, and also I think Theo, and if I get this name right, Ramasami? BJ. Yeah, BJ, there you go. Um, um, especially some of the stories that they shared as it relates to uh, not being able to talk about and share uh, stories and a lot of times according to what generation you're a part of whether you're baby boomer versus a millennial of course we know millennials tell everything um, but uh, whether you're baby boomer GI generation most of us what we do know is that um, a lot of times we don't share our stories even um, in the context of faith itself and some of the things that we um, started to take a look at was trauma-informed ministries um, and that is one of the focus that we've been moving across, not only Baltimore City, um, but also uh, making sure that pastors and leaders are aware of not only providing safety 
um, being having a context of safety, a context of trust, peer support, um, but also moving into collaboration, um, how we deal with empowerment, but also um, how we look at cultural, intergenerational, and gender issues um, within the faith community. All of those are critical elements um, if we're going to have an informed ministry perspective um, that utilizes faith-based um, um, churches, whatever that might be, um, as hubs into our community. It is critical that we do more. It is urgent uh, that we do more. Thank you, Bishop Daniels. Just is this thing on? Hello? Okay. So just piggybacking on um, what Bishop Daniels said, um, I think religion absolutely has a crucial role um, in destigmatizing mental illness. I think we should get that a little closer to this. In destigmatizing mental illness. Um, with all the diversity here in Baltimore and all the faiths that our, our um, people are practicing with regard to the religion, um, with, with people practicing, you know, Judaism, Catholicism, what have you, um, people who are stigmatized um, and feel isolated can really have a sense of inclusion in religion. And I think that's where faith-based leaders can have a role in, um, in destigmatizing mental health. Um, what the, uh, the faith-based leaders are usually the ones who are first or on the front lines of right. who are told about mental illness first. Right. And without that inclusivity, without that sense of belonging, that conversation never happens. Right. So I think um, it's, it's incumbent upon the faith-based um, leaders to, to be able to provide that environment so that that conversation can happen. And whether it's just um, improvement through prayer or guiding towards more formal treatment, um, religion can play a crucial role in, in mental health. Let me take advantage of some of the scientific expertise on this panel. We are learning rapidly about treatment and the science of mental illness and substance use disorder. The National Bureau of Economic Research tells us that people who've been diagnosed with a mental illness a mental health illness are likely to experience substance, use, substance abuse as well, whether that's alcohol, opioids, or other substances. Each of you carries a different perspective on the evolving science and treatment. Could any of you give us a brief overview from your perspective of what advances you are encountering or what's on the horizon? Oh. Well, my field is by uh, mood disorders and particularly bipolar disorder, and they actually have the highest co-occurrence with substance abuse. So uh, people who have bipolar, maybe 60% of them have a history of alcohol and or drug abuse. So it's a huge problem. I think one thing that's very good is that people are talking about it. And before I go further, I just want to say what fabulous stories. I mean, what wonderful, wonderful uh, privilege to be able to listen to such um, extraordinary lives presented succinctly and brilliantly. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think that you know, there's a lot of work that's going on in both fields in terms of science and genetics of, of both substance abuse and um, mood disorders. And I think what we know now is that you have to really treat both if you've got both. It used to be thought, well, if you just get rid of the mood disorder, um, by treating it, that that will take care of the substance abuse problem. We know that that's not true. Um, I think people just have a lot more knowledge now than they did, um, and not nearly enough. Grant, do you want to address that? Sure. Just with regard to um, psychiatric treatment in general, um, it seems that now um, we really haven't had any real new medications that have come down the pipe. Um, it seems to be a little bit stagnant these days. Um, I think the trend now is what's old is new again. Uh, we recently had FDA approval for a medication called ketamine. Um, some of you may know it as Special K, um, but we've been able to develop a medication to treat acute depression and, and suicidal ideation. Uh, we have other treatments uh, such as, uh, which is a fairly new treatment, it's called um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is um, very good and less invasive. Uh, in helping depression, treatment refractory depression, so that's depression that um, isn't really helped with medications. And then there's ECT, 
um, electroshock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy, um, which has a stigma in itself from, uh, you know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, as many of you may have seen the movie. Um, it's not like that at all, um, but it is one of the very few treatments that we consider to be a gold standard for things like depression, um, bipolar disorder, um, and other psychiatric illnesses. So there are other things in the pipeline. Um, for those of you who are baby boomers and grew up in the 60s, um, psilocybin or mushrooms are making a comeback and, and we're using it to treat anxiety and OCD. Um, so there are, there are some positive uh, aspects and trends in, in treatment, but um, you know, we don't know, as, as Michael was saying, there are a lot of uh, trial and error with medications. And unfortunately, that's kind of inherent in the psychiatric field. But uh, we do our best and we, we make educated guesses as to what might work for a patient and we go from there. I think also um, as it relates to Would looking you get at, close to the mic, Bishop oh. Daniels? But also as it relates to looking at some of the research I know that I'm looking at is not only um, how do we bridge the gap between um, moving, moving from the science and the psychiatric, and how do we bridge the gap and move into the communities um, with, um, particularly in urban settings, how do we begin to m um, bring um, more awareness and build capacity um, in our um, in our inner cities? And one of the things that I I know that I developed a part, uh, and some of the other researchers were what what we call the Levitical cycle of health. How do we use the context of whether that is a biblical approach, how do we use that for church-based church health promotion? How do we take the language of psychiatry? How do we take the language of mental health? And how do we bridge the gap and make sure that it is a conversation and a storytelling that we can have? And we publish that model because it makes it a lot easier to work with people um, within community settings who are totally stigmatized and lack the trust to work with some of the systems um, within um, within not only our city, but even around the country as well. And that model, we've done pilot work, we've done a lot of work with that model. It is an easy integration um, with moving, um, moving that conversation, those heavy conversations into um, urban settings and, and urban communities. I'm excited um, because also even my family is here, so I'm always excited about how we have that conversation. I had a chance to see Krista Taylor, um, who's here, we work together in the homeless um, 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 shelter. And in the context of the stoop, um, I had the ability while I was working as a social worker at Johns Hopkins um, for homelessness, I found my own father under a bridge who happened to be homeless with mental illness as well. So as you can imagine, um, it launched my journey and it launched my career in how do we bridge the gap um, between services and um, into our community so that people can get the help that they need. Stacey? Yeah, I, ju I just want to add, too, that I think um, in more traditional models, we would, uh, one of our speakers, or several of them, but um, spoke about how mental illnesses were treated in isolation. You treat substance abuse, and you treat mental health, and you treat the community, and you treat faith-based, and I think that um, the person and environment, the complicated factors that go into mental health, someone doesn't just have mental health. There's not one diagnosis or one symptom in that be beginning to look at people from a multi-layered lens and understand when we need to be coordinating with other providers, when we need to have systems in place that help us to be able to track medical appointments, to be able to communicate with communities and tackle some of the root issues of our mental illness that may be environmental as much as they are biological, while we're also treating the people who are experiencing them, while we're also creating systems that um, better support. So I think it's a, a very complicated issue as well. And um, while there's a, a lot of isolated um, uh, 
studies on particular diagnoses or particular models of treatment um, that really the collaboration um, that we see that I experience among providers um, is tremendous and, and an area of growth that I think is really beneficial in helping to connect our politicians and our community leaders and our religious leaders to our psychiatrists to our mental health practitioners to all those moving parts that you know our, our panelists talked almost all of them mentioned that support was the turning point to health for them, whether it was support in a clinician or support in their parents, their mom, you know, friends that they found. And so creating a community out of all of the providers and resources available gives us the best opportunity um, rather than just throwing a pill or just going to therapy once a week. So. Let me pick up on some of the points that you made and tie it in particularly with the first part of our evening. I mean, I, I find myself, aside from how wonderful the stories were, just impressed with the courage of seven people to put those stories out there, to face down the stigma. We know how pervasive stigma is, but we also know that when our friends and family and neighbors know more about what we're dealing with and how it's effective affecting us, then others are called to empathy and compassion. So I'm, I, I'd like each of you to, to talk about how the role of the personal narrative is combating stigma in your, in your own professional practice, in what you see. Uh, do you find that it is evoking more empathy, more, more respect? Yeah, I, I, I think that the role of storytelling is critical. When, as I sat there and I listened to all of the um, all of the presenters talk, you could see I, I could literally see my own story, um, because one of the things that's very critical for, um, especially people of color, is that we tell stories, um, and that is not something that just started. That's been a part of the African indigenous culture for years. Uh, storytelling, hip hop all of those kind of things, hip hop therapy, um, are some of the things that we utilize as well. But even as I sat there and I thought about the fact that I grew up in Baltimore City, where I'm pastoring now is where I grew up, um, somewhere along. Uh, so one of the things that was critical for me as well is the fact, and that's why I can tell my story, um, I'll never forget hitting my head in the YMCA on Drew, Ave Drew Hill Avenue. Um, and I'll never forget, the doctor said that um, I would always have a learning disorder um, and that I would never really, it would be, I would be um, very hindered in my ability to learn. Well, it was the community. It was the community. People that wrapped their arms around me, Dina, Henretta, they're sitting in the audience, Scott, these folk that wrapped their arms around me and provided a sense of community, safety, all of those kind of things, and um, after all of those years later, defied all of the odds, graduated from University of Maryland, Morgan State University, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, so no one can tell me that that is the end of a story. Um, it is just the beginning of a story, isn't it? Well, I think uh, I mean, there's no question we're, we're a storytelling, a story listening species. Uh, so long before people could write, they talked and they read poem. I mean, they said poems to one another. I mean, it's it's just part of who we are, and people learn best by uh, seeing someone who ha has endured or gone through something, and particularly with courage and come out the other side. Um, I think there are stories and there are stories, and, and at, at some point, sometimes, there are sort of sensational stories that I'm thinking of Hollywood in particular, where people kind of come out, tell a story, write a book, and move on. And then they say, oh, whoops, I didn't really have that uh, illness. After all, you know, I'm perfectly sane. And that kind of storytelling is really more for the storyteller than the, the people who listen. But in the community, in particular, I think in mental illness, it's become a remarkable thing and a remarkably effective sort of thing for people to hear about what other people have gone through and how they've gone through it. Um, I, I think I, I always have a little bit of a problem with the word stigma just because I think it stigmatizes. I think by, by the time you say that something uh, carries a stigma, you've already 
kind of in a way put one down. I like the word discrimination because it has a nice legal quality to it. And I think that we need to think more often about these as civil rights issues in many respects uh, in terms of health care and affordable health care. Stacy, any thoughts about narrative in the work you do? Yeah, I mean, I, echoing what's already been said, there's a tremendous research on the value of a therapeutic narrative, narrative therapy um, in the versions of hip hop and, and, and multitudes of um, others that have uh, kind of followed that. I think that there's uh, an experience that we go through when we tell our own story where we have to hear it in a different way when it comes out of our mouth and we're trying to to help someone else understand us, then we hear it inside our heads when we kind of ruminate on it ourselves. Um, oftentimes in our heads, things get simplified. This, this is the outcome, this is who I am, this is what happened, this is the effect it had on me. But when we talk to somebody else and we connect with someone else, we have an opportunity to clarify and to really think about whether those narratives that we tell in our head accurately capture the essence of who we are. And I think what we find is when we start telling our story that we have so much more courage than we thought we did, that we have a sense of ourselves, um, where the story doesn't become who we are, we become who we are in the midst of all that that we've experienced. And it gives us a kind of step back from our own experiences and ability to reassess and, and see it from a different perspective. So I, I think that the practice of storytelling um, in and of itself is beneficial to the storyteller and then it allows connection and understanding and meeting of minds and all of that beautiful stuff you know, that Kay was just sharing about hearing a story of someone else. Renz, any thoughts on this? Yeah, just very quickly, as a psychiatrist, one of the reasons why I went into psychiatry, and particularly geriatric psychiatry, is the fact that people have these, these rich tapestries, these histories that, that make them who they are. And every time I see a patient, I ask them basically, you know, what's your story? What's happened since I last have seen you? And, and I think people have these stories, they want to tell these stories, and I want to be somebody who listens to them. And, and as part of my practice, you know, I, I believe in, in listening rather than, than talking. I know some of the speakers mentioned that at, at the time they, they were getting treatment that they needed more of a speaker um, or, or a talker towards them. But um, I really feel that there's a value in, in being a listener and allowing people to tell those stories. And, and I echo what um, the other panelists have said, that, that uh, being able to tell your story and being heard is, is crucial to, um, to improving and, and getting your uh, treatment um, in a way that is, is conducive to you. Let me, um, let me ask about, a, a few of the storytellers mentioned early signs or factors that seem to appear in childhood or when they were quite young. For family members and friends who are here tonight, what, what insights can you share on early signs or factors? How can people themselves or their loved ones recognize what they might not have understood or put in context at the time? Take your first step. Stacy? <laughs> um, everything's easier to see in hindsight. <laughs> so I'll just add that um, piece that sometimes we beat ourselves up about what did I miss and what could I have done earlier and sometimes things don't make sense until they add up. And I, I think that it's important for us uh, to also recognize that. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the definition of mental illness, we all experience depression, we all experience anxiety, we all experience a multitude of um, little tiny flavors of, of mental health conditions in a given day as a healthy functioning human being who engages in the world with other healthy functioning human beings. Um, but it becomes a condition, it becomes an illness when that becomes all consuming, when it gets in the way of your ability to function in your life in the ways that you want to. And so I would encourage that when parents see children or you see others that are having a difficult time functioning in this world in a way that is productive and meaningful to them, then it's worth exploring 
getting an opinion or four or finding, you know, four therapists, if that's what it takes, to, to see whether that there's something to that or not. And I think if we eliminate the stigma of mental health, people might be more willing to do that exploration to see what happens, to see whether this is something that needs addressed or doesn't, to see if it's a mental illness or mental condition or if it's, it's them dealing with the stress of their life. Okay. Um, a, a couple of things. First of all, I think with mood disorders, depression and bipolar illness, we know a tremendous amount about these illnesses. We, they've been studied for hundreds and hundreds of years. We know a lot about the natural course of the illness. We know the age of onset. We know that in the case of bipolar illnesses, particularly genetic. So if you have a family history of um, mental illness or of suicide or of alcoholism, uh, or drug abuse, that's an important thing to know, and that's an important thing to be very direct about with, with children and kids. Uh, one of my colleagues at Hopkins, Karen Schwartz, has a very, uh, very proactive, very interesting, and now uh, spread across the United States program of just teaching, going into the school systems, public and private school systems, and teaching teachers, students, and family members, uh, parents, about the symptoms of depression so that they know in advance uh, of what, what it looks like, what, what depression looks like. If kids start withdrawing, uh, if kids start ruminating, uh, you know, are, are slowed down, what, what, agitated, irritable, whatever, there are a series of things so that we know that uh, a lot about the symptoms and how they present. What we don't do so well is educate. And I think one of the important things is people should just know a lot more about what these illnesses look like um, instead of you know avoiding talking about it one of the things I'm struck by I go I spend a lot of time on college campuses is that parents knowing that they have this illness for example bipolar illness in their families don't sit down before they take their kid goes off to school and just have a very direct conversation saying we've we've got this illness of the family the odds are against uh, you're getting it but if you do this is what it looks like and uh, well, here's, here's a name of three specialists that be sure and contact me, be sure and contact somebody, and here's his list of doctors and so forth. But just talk about it. I mean, I think, again, whether it's stigma or not stigma, it's, it's sometimes just confusion or lack of education about the symptoms and the course of the illness. These, these are really treatable illnesses, and they're really devastating if they don't get treated. Um, one of the things that's, and even in the faith community, um, is the fact that we, we, we have to um, definitely make sure that we don't hide behind scriptures or we don't hide behind um, ritualistic practices at some time. So a lot of times, one of the things that we, a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't even realize that in the DSM-5, of course, there is the V code 6289 that literally deals with religion, spirituality, combined religious and spiritual problem, but also lastly, an overlap of religious and spiritual problem with a disorder. Um, and a lot of that, some of that is what I teach at Morgan State University. As a matter of fact, we taught it in the School of Social Work, but now it's in for the university across the university campus because one of the things that we do have to, re we do have to be able to realize at what point um, in the continuum of spirituality and religion, at what point does, is there a disorder present and are we able to recognize that? So being able to have those kind of conversations and being open and honest about it, realizing, recognizing, but also um, 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 being able to be in a position where we don't re-traumatize um, because we're trying to avoid having conversations. So storytelling, testimonies, all of those kind of things, um, things that we already do, you know, in a, in a church, um, especially in a high contact church, you, you and I know um, that it's a call and response. I just don't lecture to my audience, um, you know, they in the audience saying, yeah, yeah. So again, just being able to recognize, being able to have the conversation, normalizing the conversation. It's okay. As a pastor, I have to tell them, it's okay. Hear my story. Let me have a catharsis. Hear my, I'll give you permission to tell yours because I tell mine. It's real important for them. Very quickly. 
very quickly, um, I'd be remiss if, um, if I didn't mention this because my wife kind of schooled me before I came. She's a child psychiatrist. Uh, as Kay was saying, very practically, irritability, social isolation, any change in functioning of, of a child or a teenager. If you have a child who plays video games constantly and all of a sudden they pick up one day and they don't want to touch their video games, that's a sign. So look for things, look for changes that, that occur in, in your child's life and, and get help if you, if you think you need it, but at least open that conversation if you notice that. Before I let you go this evening, I'd love to hear from each of you at least one, one step, one act that each of us in this room could do, what, what your ideas are about how we take some of the insights we've gotten this evening and turn them into action. And I'm going to reverse the order and start with you, Renz. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I think a great first step in uh, destigmatizing or decreasing the discrimination of um, mental illness is coming together as a community like we've done here today and, and starting that conversation or maintaining that conversation about mental health. Um, on a night where you could be home sitting on your porch watching a beautiful Baltimore sunset or uh, watching the Orioles get demolished by the Yankees down at Camden Yards tonight, um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's something where, where you all chose to come here tonight. And for someone with, with mental illness, someone who's been stigmatized or isolated, marginalized, however you want to term it, that means a whole lot. Not only tonight are we able to exchange information that's accurate and, and up-to-date, we're also able to give people hope. And your presence here can show people that you care. Your presence here can show people that there are people willing to help people in their struggle with mental illness. In my short time here in Baltimore and Maryland, I've come to realize that the Orioles and the Ravens should be revered. Um, that the word hun belongs to Baltimore and only Baltimore, um, that I should love Crab. steamed crabs with Crab. Old Bay. Crab. I've also come to the understanding that, um, that the stoop and storytelling are woven into the fabric of Baltimore, of, of the identity of Baltimore. So consider this a doctor's order. Um, when I'm trying to get my patients to do something, as I think Mary was saying, you know, I give them this exercise to do, and, and I'd like to throw this out to all of you, is to find your stoop, be it a doctor's office, your actual front or back stoop, your, um, your uh, coffee shop, your street corner, whatever your stoop happens to be. Start a conversation. Tell your psychiatric illness story, whether it, it's actually you or someone that you know. And as any good conversation should go, listen to someone else's story, listen to someone else's struggle with psychiatric illness. And by having these conversations, as Bishop Daniel said, we can normalize mental illness. We can, we can take it out of stigma shadow, which is the whole purpose of tonight. And, and I want people to realize that the same way the heart gets sick, the kidney gets sick, the liver gets sick, the brain gets sick, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now I follow. <laughs> um, I would I would make two charges. The the first is to talk talk about your experience here. I think that that's a pretty easy, chewable one to mention to your neighbor, your friend, your coworker tomorrow. Yeah, I went to this really interesting, hopefully, uh, presentation last night, and this is what it was about. And starting the conversation about mental health before it needs to, before it becomes an emotional conversation for you or that person, to normalize discussions, to normalize this information. Um, the second charge, which I've um, offered before and may be familiar to some people in this room, um, is the simple act of hello and how are you and meaning it when we say how are you. Um, and I'm just as guilty as flippantly saying, oh, hi, how are you? And then, you know, moving on your way. But I think, you know, we get away from really um, listening to those answers and we get away from really answering them. Um, and so um, I, I would, as a practical charge, you to think about um, maybe... 
thinking about those answers and listening to them when they're offered to you. So those can also be starting points for you to gather information about how someone's doing and if they might need support or advice or encouragement, seeking more help or, or what have you. Uh, but. Thank you. Hey, Rickfield Jamieson. Um, I would say, I mean, again, coming back to storytelling is, is to read and listen to stories and, and be eclectic in, in the stories you listen to. Um, the second thing I would say is that I think it is really important to um, get educated about these illnesses. And at a very practical level, I always encourage patients and family members to take in a badger list so that when they go see a clinician, uh, whether it's for psychotherapy or for medications, to have a list of questions so that you don't get kind of unglued, unrattled, uh, intimidated, um, annoyed uh, in the presence of the clinician, but are, have literally concretely down. That's a very concrete sort of suggestion, but I, it's, it's remarkable how many people don't end up asking the questions that they want to ask. And the third thing, I hate to, to go on about the politics of this, but I, 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 in public forum after public forum after public forum, um, you know, for the last 30 years, and I think if you watch the, the career of the wonderful Rosalind Carter, who's been doing this forever and a day at the Carter Center, um, and before that as the First Lady in, in Georgia and then as First Lady of the United States, is that watching the politics of finally getting a, affordable care uh, and having mental illness covered in parity was only a few years ago, okay? It's a tremendous amount of effort, tremendous amount of time on the, right, on the part of, of uh, people all across the United States. And in the last two years, it's being shredded. And that is, Ultimately, I, I, for a long time, until the last two years, I have not talked about politics because it's an important fact. You know, Republicans and Democrats have get similar illnesses as across the aisle. You know, the gene, genes don't care who, who you vote for. But the fact of the matter is that it doesn't do any good to have good stories. It doesn't have any good do good to have good treatments if you don't have affordable care that people can get. And it's just that simple. Bishop Daniels, you've, you've given us a few suggestions already this evening. Is there a final charge you would leave well, us well, with? Well, again, I think the last one, I think we're demonstrating that tonight as far as coalition building um, and collaboration. Um, all of these great sponsors, the Associated Jewish Community, Jewish Council, Baltimore Magazine, Behavioral Health, Catholic Charities, um, Faith Health Network, the MedStar NAMI, um, and I also include um, the Black Mental Health Alliance as far as, and also the Minister's Conference. Um, we need to continue to, um, to call to coalesce together and continue to build and continue to hear each other's stories. All of that becomes something um, extremely critical. Last night I was on the phone, I organized um, Baltimore City, a lot of the leaders in Baltimore, and we just literally had a phone conversation about Taraji P. Henson's conference coming up on the state of mental health in black communities. And we just had a conversation, uh, um, councilmen, policy makers, all of, we just, I just, I am a community organizer as well, pulling together people to have these conversations becomes critical to um, uh, tackling some of these issues. We cannot do this alone, we must do this together. Let's thank this for their insights. Thank you very much. This has been terrific. This is an important conversation that has to continue. I want to remind everyone that uh, uh, the behavioral health resources for all the partner organizations are listed in your program. This is the moment when I should have a program here to show you, but you've seen the program. Um, and I also want to ask your cooperation in a short evaluation that we will send in a few days to everyone who registered online. The partner organizations would really like your feedback and suggestions so that they can foster more dialogue and conversations. It is 
a big part of bringing mental health out of stigma's shadow. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being with us tonight. Let's keep this conversation going.